Hello, today I'm back at it, having a conversation on technology cognition and the importance of us human beings in the future of technology. For too long, new frontiers of technology have been scary to many people, and artificial intelligence is no exception. And it's important that we showcase the humanness in AI and realize that AI needs people to flourish, but more importantly, provide guidance. Now, with all this in mind, I'm joined by Delete Steiger. She's the co-founder of the Swiss Cognitive and a leader in the global AI community. So what should we expect from AI? And more importantly, what should we expect from people within the technology? Well, stay tuned to listen and learn more. Well, hello, Dilit. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you and really kind of diving into this world of AI, along with a lot of other people that are trying to experience and explore it in many different ways. But uh, before we go on with the discussion, I was wondering if you could please just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are, and uh, tell us a little bit about the Swiss Cognitive, if you could. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. First of all, thanks for having me. Yeah. So who am I in a nutshell? Yeah. I'm a serial entrepreneur, born in Israel, grew up in Switzerland, and uh, one of my goals is to Switzerlize the globe. Ah, Besides okay. my drive, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can talk about that later. Yeah, that we can. <laughs> um, so besides my drive for cognitive technologies, obviously, mm -hmm. I'm a loving mother of two young women, 18 and 21. I'm an absolutely family person, a passionate mountain biker and a huge fan of high heel shoes. So oh, this is pretty okay. much about me. <laughs> <laughs> now Got I'm the, also the co-founder. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, are they AI powered <laughs> high heeled shoes? But no, we don't have to go there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah. honestly, this is one of my projects that uh, I'm uh, already working on and thinking yeah. on, you know, having like this smart high heel. Yeah, Ooh, uh, it hey. always needs to be fun, fun, engage with your business. And as it's my passion anyway, so mm -hmm. yeah. Well, speaking yeah, so, of business, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry. Yeah. And uh, I'm the co-founder together with uh, Andy uh, of Swiss Cognitive. Swiss Cognitive mm -hmm. is a world-leading AI network committed to unleashing AI in business. So we're very much business-oriented, down-to-earth, real use cases. And anyway, we'd rather talk about cognitive technology than AI because for me, AI is misleading because if we're talking about artificial joints, artificial origins, organs, even artificial uh, plants, we always assume that it's going to be as near to the future as possible. But if we talk about um, artificial intelligence, we're actually not seeking to really copy our brain or copying the human being. So this is why actually we rather talk about cognitive technology. So we are a highly respected cross-industry global community of business leaders and AI experts transparently exchanging about development and implementation of AI and uh, spotlighting hats on use cases, challenges, successes and opportunities, both in boardrooms, global stages. It's really about share for success because we can learn from each other. I think this is one of the most important things. And this is, by the way, also how we can increase trust in this whole subject. Well, I, I, I like that approach because it, what comes to mind is that decentralization of the intelligence around this, because not oh, yeah. any one person knows everything there is to know about AI or its potential. And, uh, and to your point of, you know, uh, getting rid of the myths surround AI, uh, because a lot of people still have an uncertainty of what it is. It, it, to many, it, it feels like it's science fiction in some aspects, okay. <laughs> but in other aspects, it's, it's actually a reality now. It's being used globally in many different facets. And uh, I, I, I've talked to some folks of, you know, 
you may be using AI and not even know it uh, as you interact Absolutely. with your smartphone. Uh, Absolutely. You speak, yeah, you speak to into say, it. Yeah. You know, man, we, we do have actually more yeah. cognitive technology in here than we are aware of. Mm -hmm. And one thing, and I think that's a very important one, talking about, you know, the daily devices that we're using that mm -hmm. has kind of AI in it. You know, I remember, I mean, still today, but uh, I would say three years ago, it was mm -hmm. really hard if you discussed about uh, Siri or Alexa, or right. however you want to call it. I mean, People said, you know, but it doesn't work and it's not good. <laughs> and then you go like, hey, come on, the systems need to learn. This is why we're talking right. about cognitive technology. It's an iterative process. So if we're not sharing with the technology, our knowledge, our voices, whatever it is, how can this, how can this device learn? How can this algorithm learn? How do right. kids learn, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is really funny. And I mean, these days when I'm sitting in the car, I mean, I just talk to my mobile phones and it mm -hmm. writes for me the emails or, or messages or whatever, because I mean, driving, you shouldn't, you, sh you shouldn't uh, yeah. do anything on your mobile anyway. So right. by the time, actually, at least for me, it works very well and even in different languages. So it doesn't matter if it's English, German, even Hebrew. Yeah. So this is really nice. So we can make a huge use of technology to support ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I like what you mentioned there as far as the different languages. It's actually helping break down barriers between uh, different uh, peoples and cultures and things to yeah. you know, real-time real translation of, of, of words, even, um, even audio, uh, almost mm -hmm. near real-time translation so you can have a, a conversation uh, okay. that feels a bit more natural um, in, in connecting with people. I think that's what a lot of times that that language barrier hindered that connection that you could have or sharing of ideas um, around Absolutely. things. And it it brings me to something I was I was wanting to ask is uh, obviously with the across this was cognitive. I'm sure a lot of people have uh, have a lot of questions and comments and things of that nature. But what are the most common things that you're seeing around in and around uh, AI? Is there a lot of common things that, or is it just still that uncertainty and kind of questioning, what can we do with it? Yeah, absolutely. And if I may, I would rather first uh, give you a, a comment on what you said, because sure. I think yeah. this is really essential, mm -hmm. the connecting with people to be exposed to other cultures, other countries. Mm -hmm. I think this is exactly one of the, the huge advantages of technology overall. And uh, when I think, especially now during the pandemic, that we have been forced, based on the lack of alternative, really forced to use technology to meet each other, to discuss each, with each other, the whole questions about ethics, about responsible, about trust, got, a, for me, a total different view. Because people realized, you know, now kind of we have a community without borders. We have discussions, roundtables, meetings with people all over the world. And when we talk about, and I guess we will get to this point later yep. on also, the trust responsible of AI. What does mm -hmm. it mean? What is ethics? What is the standard? If we're talking in Switzerland, even in, in France or Italy, if you go further to Africa, the States, China, I mean, this is just totally different. And I think it helps a lot. And a huge advantage that the technology gives us is this interpersonal relationship, having more time to, with each other and actually have the chance to get to learn other people and other cultures. And this, just what you mentioned about, you know, this almost simultaneously translated, um, uh, how do you say, like that, that it gets translated simultaneously. We have been lucky that before the pandemic we have been for a whole month in ecuador and i'm talking several languages but unfortunately i do not talk spanish or portuguese what made it a bit difficult but because we had the chance of using the technology we were able to connect with people and one person was actually until today a good friend of ours was by accident one of the taxi driver and he just didn't, he didn't talk any other language. 
but we were communicating with each other and at the end he actually accompanied uh, us for almost two days and it oh, was wow. brilliant yeah we have we we went together to a restaurant and we were sitting together and we were literally communicating via our devices yeah. had a great laugh and yeah. until today we're chatting back and forward everyone in his language kind of yeah. sending it in the other's language so this is just lovely well, but yeah I, coming back to your question yeah, yeah. sorry well i was going to this uh, on that it, uh, it kind of ties into what i said i think a lot of the questions and comments you get around is how i'm assuming is how can we break down those barriers you know i, I you know we are a global people if you think about it and uh, one thing about that i've seen about ai is a lot of people are concerned about is it going to replace people but in my mind it should be helping augment people to to your point that great conversation you just had down at a personal level with somebody mm -hmm. uh you know let alone a business level but a personal level to connect share ideas experiences because i think um our expectations around technology are uniquely different depending on you know geography uh, but when you get to understand somebody and get down to the core of it, a lot of times those experiences you have or expectations, there's a lot of similarities in there. Mm -hmm. And that could really help with where should we take this technology? What questions should we be asking to learn more about it? So I, I don't know. It, it's just an exciting time to be in to, to again, break down those barriers uh, with folks. And I, so back to that question, our, our is that a lot of the themes and comments you're seeing is uh, around AI is, is kind of, what are the expectations there? What kind of uh, barriers can we remove or what are the capabilities? It varies a lot. Mm. It varies a lot. And one of the most important thing is education, education, mm -hmm. education. We really need to do a lot of awareness campaigning, explaining, the power of the technology and also the obstacles of the technology, the mm -hmm. boundaries of the technology. And one of the most important thing to me is also we shouldn't talk in absolute terms. You know, I mean, okay. on, on this one uh, um, article that you shared with me, it says that kind of in 45 years, if I hope I'm going to quote it <laughs> right, uh, in 45 years, pretty much all uh, activities, actions from a human being are going to be replaced by technology. Hmm. When I, and I, I'm not sure I really quoted it now, like word by word, but it was oh, pretty much fine. in this uh, direction. Mm -hmm. When I read that, I said, you know, if someone doesn't really know a lot about that, I mean, then you really get afraid. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Everything and everyone is going to be replaced by technology with what we're doing. And then, by the way, funny wise, one thing came up into my mind that definitely will never, ever gonna be replaced, but anything. This is actually giving birth, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, that's something I, I obviously, yeah. I have no personal experience with my wife. Wife could say otherwise, obviously, <laughs> her personal experience, but yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm but sure I mean, we could have a virtual up... simulation of it, but not the whole yeah, but it the doesn't make physical sense. and emotional it's experience simply, yeah <laughs> exactly no so, i love that you know yeah. when i read when i read <laughs> through that and it just came up to me like okay i mean i'm sure there are quite some other examples that mm. it's just not going to happen by because it can't then a lot mm. of things maybe or can but we as human beings just not going to let it be because we don't mm -hmm. need it we don't use it we don't want it uh, not everything that can be developed and implemented is being developed and implemented. This has mm -hmm. been showed also in the history. So we are afraid of something if we don't know it, if we can't handle it. And if I'm saying we need to know the power of the technology, I'm not talking about bits and bytes. You don't need to be able to develop in Python, for example, but you need right. to understand the power and the chances that the technology gives to you. And as you mentioned, by reduce cases, what can it be? Because people there where the fear comes from is especially if we're talking about super intelligence. 
superintelligence today even doesn't exist in labs. So why do we why do we discuss that so intense? Why don't we focus mainly on those use cases where we see the small steps, how actually we as a society are getting more mature together with the technology. So if we're looking at where we stand today and extrapolate this in 45 years, we can't judge how we will actually act or react. Because obviously we're getting more mature with the development. So a lot of things gonna be developed differently than we think of today, because we're doing this step by step together. The more we know, the better we can act. And we have to be very conscious, obviously on this ethical aspect. And we are happy that we have a lot of governments, the UN and so on, taking care of it. And I always say for me, the ethical aspect on AI is on the same level discussion like human rights and children's rights. It's one of the most difficult thing because it always depends on the culture, on the ethical and moral background. And this is just very diverse in our globe, obviously. If you don't mind, so, I, I, I was going to yeah, interject sure. is that um... I like that you brought up those points as, as from the cognitive aspect that you, you mentioned earlier, kind of the uh, throwing back to the name is that as the AI needs to be learning and, and so forth, it, us humans need to be learning as well uh, along the way to, as you say, maturity of the usage of the, of the technology and how we interact with it. Um, mm -hmm. And when I mentioned the augmented people there's there's already uh, in the works of having you know uh collaborative ai to act as an, as like an assistant to you in other words but it's only to help you uh achieve or do something we should always be in the light of uh i i always go back to uh, i'm amazed by as more and more as i delve into this is that um the great positive use cases we're seeing from uh, and transformative use cases of ai you know, with um, environmental aspects and sustainability and, you know, water conservation and, and uh, agriculture and farming, uh, learning from that, from a, uh, even using digital simulations to, so we don't waste precious resources to use technology to simulate something before we try it out on, you know, something that mm -hmm. may be a limited resource. So I think the kind ethics the around, twins. yes, exactly. The ethics around AI is more than just ethics of, how we use the technology, but how can we ethically use it in a way for uh, for sustainability and mm -hmm. um, uh, impacting of our of our humanness around the world uh, in a way that benefits all of us as a as a people on this planet. So uh, that's what I, I look at is that balance of of the technical ethical aspects and the mm -hmm. ethics that we talked mm -hmm. about from a people aspect. So I I, I love that. Uh, you know, approach. And I always talk about the practical real world things of technology. <laughs> and um, it's like, I mentioned that science fiction earlier. And when people, you can turn around and say, well, hey, because of this technology and this AI, or uh, like I said, digital twins and so forth, mm -hmm. we were able to do these things over here and it had a direct impact on this community or this uh, area of the country, you know, um, and I love seeing those stories and surfacing that and highlighting that, that uh, yeah. it makes it makes us be more in my mind, it makes me more appreciative of the intelligence and effort that goes into using technology in the right way. Uh, it on. just Yeah. So, um, well, you know, what, we're there's we're perhaps kind of just like one one, yes, one go uh, ahead. example just to hop in here. Uh, that uh, also, you know, if we're talking about these things and we're showing these examples, there is this aha effect that mm, people mm -hmm. think of, yeah, actually you're right. Um, the old days, you know, when you got, when, when you went to a doctor and he told you, you know, you need to have a surgery because you have something very serious. So what did we do? We went to get at least a second opinion or a third. But these days we can get 
thousands of second opinions, kind of, you know, when we're using cognitive technology. And the important thing is not that we, how do you say, that we, um, um, that the, the doctors are not necessary anymore, that they get redundant. It's not about that. It's about giving them tools, how they can actually support uh, the human being better, how, can, how they can uh, uh, have a better view and, and a lower risk and so on and so forth. And this is it. This is such a simple uh, example how we see that Okay, then we went to the second opinion, a third opinion that this doctor called his colleague in the States, in Australia, in wherever. But still, these, these were people who had their experience and it's obvious that we as a human being actually are trusting more a human being than a technology. But I'm sure that in a few, in a, in a little time, especially our kids, they will look at us and say, and you trusted this person? You trusted this driver? I would never sit next to you driving a car. How right. come? Are you nuts? You know, this is, yeah. this hey, is well, something, I mean, we, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, it reminds me of an example. My grandfather was in the, um, was in the Korean War, uh, and mm -hmm. he was a paratrooper. And um, something that they had back then was that the, uh, when they were packing the parachute packs for their for their backs yeah. that the person behind you packed your parachute oh, yeah. so you had to have that trust of the person Brilliant in example. your group behind you and they had a little tiny book that they a little ledger book that they would sign of who packed this parachute uh and so it <laughs> and if it literally you're putting your life in the person's hands behind you because it would cut open and deploy perfectly fine or if it was packed wrong in a slight little way it couldn't and mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so to your point of putting the trust in on, at other peoples and then now the trust in technology it does uh you know at some point you do have to put your trust in it and, and remove that fear because there's a lot of that fear still there it's uh it's f, f u d fear uncertainty and doubt that a lot of people have uh, around all of this. Um, well, we're almost out of time, but I was wondering if you had a couple of little short takeaways. I mean, I love chatting with you. The time flew by. <laughs> I, I'm sure we could keep chatting for a long, long time, but is there a couple of great takeaways that we could leave the listeners? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, one thing is I would I, I like to say that it's not the technology that is dangerous. It's mm. the people behind it. Mm. We have to set the rules, but on the other hand, we shouldn't limit ourselves too much. So I think this is one for me, one of the core things, you know, we wouldn't need policemen if we would trust a human being. We wouldn't need cybersecurity if we would trust a human being. So yes, we need to have rules, we need to set the rules, but at the end of the day, we shouldn't blame the, the technology, it's up to us and we need to ensure that's not gonna uh, harm us or let's say reduce it. We will never get rid of it totally. And the other thing, um, if, and this is especially to the listeners, if you want to be a world champion, you have to innovate. I mean, productivity and growth will change your business by five, perhaps even 50%, but it's finite. Growth by definition is finite. But innovation in this sense does not talk about growth, but it talks about added value. So this is, this is for me with innovation, you discover your new stars and you multiply their value. I love that. That's, that's some great practical uh things i always like to leave people with things to consider and think about challenge yourself with something not yeah. just uh uh something fleeting that can go away in just a moment but it's really like a personal look inside of uh, you know challenging you and and your outlook on humanity and your outlooks on, on technology and how we use it but thank you so much uh, for joining me today. I've loved the welcome. conversation. Uh, we'll have to have you on again in the, in, uh, in the future. 
to have another conversation, but uh, it's been a total pleasure and uh, exploring this world and uh, ever expanding world of AI. Thanks a lot.